is the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs, with your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me as always is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. He was never much a man who was a fan of a sequel, Stu Horvath. <laughs> this, is, this is like a spiritual sequel. Is it? Because I've never heard of the thing that it was supposed to be based on to begin with, and that's something that we talked about the other week, and here we are today <laughs> talking about Harn. Harn. And there's one of those little pointy things over the A. Harn? I think it's still pronounced Harn. Han? Han? It's like the umlaut in Blue Oyster Cult. It's not metal without them, you know? Eh, that's all right, you know. It's not a fantasy RPG without the little pointy thing over the A. I'm hip. I'm with it. <laughs> so Harn, right? Okay. So yeah, this is sort of like a spiritual sequel to Chivalry and Sorcery. A couple weeks ago, we talked about how like there was this idea that, you know, D&D wasn't real enough, realistic enough. And Chivalry and Sorcery and a couple other games kind of stepped up to try and make games that were more realistic and simulated more of, you know, you know what people felt was realistic. I feel like realism is a word that you kind of can bat around a lot. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah, especially in games when there's dragons. Yeah, exactly. You know, like you're fundamentally not realistic at that point to me. So the thing about chivalry and sorcery is that they came at it from an interesting place. Fantasy wargaming. You remember that weird book uh, that came out of England? Certainly do. They did the same thing. They were just like, D&D did it wrong. We we're going to make it like medieval and we're going to make it as realistic as possible. And like they were doing it sort of out of spite, out of spite of D and they're just like we could do this better D and D did it wrong chivalry and sorcery actually comes at it from a different perspective and i think i kind of glossed over this a little bit in the episode that we did about it uh, a couple weeks ago and the thing that they felt was lacking in D and D was anything aside of the dungeon crawl and they're right so like they wanted like a world that they could come out of the dungeon and like spend their money and gain power and interact with like villages and leaders and politics and all this stuff that comes with living in an actual, you know, complex, living, breathing world. I want those things too, Hambo. <laughs> so like, I think that they identified like a very real problem that people wanted solved. I just think that they solved it wrong. I, they got hung up in this idea that they had to like bind it to the same sort of mathematical simulation that combat is sort of bound to in a, in a role-playing game. And they wanted to simulate this complex world. And that bogs everything down because now you have all of these crazy systems interacting. And, like, that's hard to manage if you're a human and not a computer, you know? Yeah, I mean, when you think of adding a dice mechanic to an argument... <laughs> <laughs> right? It's kind of, we want you to immerse yourself in the fantasy role-playing aspect of a role-playing game, and we want you to really envelop yourself and embed yourself in these characters, and then we're going to have you roll some dice and kind of see how this conversation actually goes, where you have people who are normally just tepid baseline about doing any kind of role-playing, and then it's just like, and we're going to let the dice decide. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, I mean, there are games that can simulate that that are modern and have very different priorities and aesthetics, but definitely not back in 70-whatever. You're right. It just winds up being like, well, we're going to roll the dice and find out what happens. And the role play that you're supposed to be facilitating takes a back seat to all of this math and randomness management. What Chivalry and Sorcery is, though, is a really well-researched source book for simulating a medieval country or realm. And that's interesting. And that's what Harn is sort of the spiritual sequel to. Harn comes out in 1983, several years after Chivalry and Sorcery. And Harn is created by a fellow named N. Robin Crosby. And he just goes at this idea of creating a reasonable facsimile of a medieval culture. But what if there were fantasy elements? So there's orcs. I hate orcs at this point. Like, I just don't like orcs anymore. But there's orcs in Harn. That's fine. 
Uh, there's other monsters. There is magic, which is a really interesting system of magic, and I'll get back to that because that's actually one of the really important things that Harn produces. But like his idea was like to just create something with as much verisimilitude, reflective of our real world, while still having fantasy elements. And he did it without a system. He didn't care initially about the world having a role-playing system. It's made specifically for a role-playing game. So theoretically, like, you know, you can use any system for it. You could, D&D is probably what he's aiming for because it's the most widespread, but you could use Role Master, you could use GURPS, whatever. Like, you could take this world and play your game in it. And that's the only thing that he wanted to work on was the world. It's perfect. Hambone, it's so good. Really? It's so detailed and interesting. Like, when I was a kid... Like National Geographic and Reader's Digest both had like these sort of mysteries of the world books. They were big sort of like dictionary encyclopedia style books. And it was just like entries about like cultural stuff all over the world. Like some of it's spooky. Some of it's just like, you know, crystal skulls or like the Maya calendar, like stuff like that. It's just like all these factoids about stuff. And it's like my favorite kind of book like that because it's all killer no filler like i'm not worried about context i'm not worried about like what produces it or what else was going on and like it's literally just the cool thing and the immediate details about what makes it cool over and over and over again entry after entry after entry i loved books like that as a kid i filled my head with it i think that that's a very proto dungeon master thing to want if you're like me and you devour information like that like, I think that you will love Harn because it's the same thing, except it's a fictional world. And like, because it's a fictional world, you can start seeing immediately how you would play a game in it. And he goes crazy. It is insane. The amount of detail he dumps into this world. That is huge. They put out a 16 volume encyclopedia. Now, granted, what? these are very... Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> a 16 volume encyclopedia? Yeah, the Encyclopedia Harnica. Now, granted, a single volume is not more than 20 pages, but it's still 400-something pages. Okay, so I should back up. Harn is just a small island with like four or five kingdoms on it off the coast of a much larger continent. So Encyclopedia Harnica just details everything. The first book that comes out is called Harn World, which, as I said, is a misnomer because Harn is actually just you know, a small island. There's two books in the first folio edition, and one is sort of just like an overview of like the cultures, religions, stuff like that. There is an intricate religious system with gods and stuff, but critically, the book never says if they're real or not, which I think is a wonderful detail. <laughs> because he doesn't have to worry about the magic system because there's no rule system, you know? So like, that's up to you, man. Oh, that's <laughs> clever. Right? And then there's the Harn Dex, which is basically just an encyclopedia of stuff that's of interest on the island. Over the course of the next couple of years, and it's literally just two years, he details everything on that island to the point where all of his stuff up to this point is put out by a company called Columbia Games. And it's, it's a pretty big hit. Like, people really are interested in this and people are using the material. But after a year or two, he's put out so much stuff in such rapid succession that they actually finished Harn. <laughs> <laughs> so like everything was out there like and he gets down to like there's books on each individual castle in Harn. you have everything you need to know every square mile of this island is detailed in a way that is ready for you as the game master to stick it in a game and then he starts working on the continent <laughs> and then he gets to the continent yeah <laughs> the first one is in Vinica, which is the viking corollary and slowly, over the course of time, the rest of the continent gets filled out. And it's just this huge, super ambitious project that, like, knowing role-playing games and the industry the way I do, whenever you start an ambitious project and it's actually good, the chances of you getting anywhere near completion is, like, slim to none. It's like sticking volume one on the cover of your book without volume two already written. That's some balls. You're asking for it. But somehow, yeah, he just cranks all this stuff out, and it's fascinating. It is baseline medieval. You get that web of military interest, political interest, religious interest, there's social things, and each different region has like a different take on it. So like, like there's a lot of conflicting points of view. So it's a bit of a hard scrabble world. Life is hard in Harn. It's just ripe for a bunch of adventurers to kind of accumulate a little bit of power in that world in an interesting way. Like you could see yourselves quickly establishing yourselves as the 
I don't want to say rulers, but that's probably the best word of like a small community or like a fort. And then like having all the headaches and problems that come along with that kind of responsibility too. And then that makes your adventuring more troublesome and enriching at the same time, right? Because like you have to weigh your decisions about, you know, like, oh, well, I wanted to go into that cave. And it's just like, but a lot of people, you know, depend on you. Should you be going in that cave? Captain Kirk, should you be going on the away mission? You know, I think that that's just stuff that like, especially in 83, like you still aren't getting a lot of that kind of nuanced role playing experience. And Harn is really formative, I think, for that. I think that once Harn hits, I think it's just it's like a wake up call to everybody else to be like, oh, my God, this is what we could be doing with a a campaign world. We could make it this detailed and people will read it, play in it and want to like expound upon it. So Crosby puts out a ton of material, right? And it's successful enough, and eventually he succumbs to temptation and makes a system to go along with it. Oh, no. Yeah, and it's just like, didn't you know that this was going to go bad? Come on. That was like the exact thing he was against, and he went and did it. Yeah, and he did. It's called Harnmaster, and you know that the guy who makes the incredibly detailed medieval world that's a fantasy land, too, is going to make an incredibly detailed role-playing system. It's hard to be critical of this, you know? Well, yeah, because, as you know, the old saying says, you either die a hero or live long enough to become the villain. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Right. Fisherman's good to fish, you know? A gardener's good to garden. A detailed role-playing game designer is good at detailed role-playing game design. There's just no escaping it. The bummer of it is that tinkering with this crazy system sort of takes over Crosby's life and the amount of Harn world material suffers after the rules come out because there's just so many things that you have to write rules for. And that's fine, you know, whatever. But eventually the company, Columbia, kind of monkeys around with the system. They want it to be a little bit lighter. (laughs) And he's like, no. And he also wants there to be more Harn material. And they're just like, well, uh, you know, we got to hold off. And and there's just friction. So he eventually leaves And then after he leaves, it's not clear who owns Harn. Oh, no. But it's sort of a happy ending because they both just keep making Harn stuff. (laughs) Nobody sues, you know, so it never got resolved. So they never resolve it. They never work together. They just quietly make their own versions of Harn. So it's like having two versions of L.A. Guns, one with Tracy Guns and one with the other guys. (laughs) Exactly. And they both go off, you know, in their own directions. Unfortunately, Crosby died a few years back, so his harn sort of ended with him. But a lot of people are very invested in keeping this idea of a canon harn alive. And I think that's really uh, something interesting. Well, it becomes something bigger than itself, really. You know, in past episodes, we've definitely talked about the idea of Dungeons and Dragons and how that really does belong to the fans, whereas Wizards of the Coast owned the actual IP of Dungeons and Dragons. So I could see something like this where you have such a rich community of people who believe in it and support in it and love it that are going, you know what, we are going to carry this on in a way that's true and befitting of this world And kind of stick to it and not let it die. And I think there's something really special about that. Yeah, Uh, for sure. And I think that's one of the few instances where you're going to hear about fans taking ownership of something and really honoring where it came from and not bastardizing it and ruining it for everybody else. (laughs) Yeah. I think the Harn community is cool. I wish it was an easier system. It makes sense to me that the system is going to be complex, but I wish that it wasn't just because I have no tolerance for that level of crunch anymore. But I know people who run Harn. They use the Harn system for other games, actually. Really? Yeah. It does work uh, as sort of a generic kind of system on a certain level. I feel like the name Harn Master is sort of a hint that Crosby had Roll Master on the mind when he designed it. It, it, A lot of it... feels similar to me although i think that that is something that is a little bit controversial of a statement i think that other people think it has more to do with a different system that i don't know off the top of my head like i read that book i'm just like ooh, this feels so role mastery real quick though speaking of D, the main thing that is sort of like of interest to D folks is aside of the fact that harn sort of sparks a larger sort of arms race for campaign worlds that D&D players benefited from in the long run. Second edition's magic system is basically modeled off of the way he structured magic in Harn. 
specifically through opposing schools. He lays it out. It's much more elegant in Harn because it has like that grounding in the world and it's very philosophical and, and reflects sort of like elements of like paganism and wiccanism and stuff that he sort of synthesized into his world. So like it has like this connection that just feels a lot more organic and interesting. You understand like that it has to get stripped out to be like a core system in Dungeons and Dragons. Like it has to be like a little bit bland, a little bit more abstract, but it's the same thing. The idea that, you know, you pick a school and like the opposite school is sort of forbidden to you and you can get really, really powerful in, in your specialized magic school. It's all color coded too, I believe. I think like you have green mages and blue mages and whatever, which leads to the one thing that D&D second edition doesn't take, which I think is super interesting, is that your magical knowledge and power grows to a certain level. You can actually transcend the idea of magical schools and become a gray mage and then access everything and more powerful stuff besides. And I think that's a super interesting thing. And I don't understand why D&D didn't take that, you know? I love it. I love it so much. And I love it on so many different levels. And isn't that awesome? Every week we do these shows. And when we stray away from D&D, we really see the world of RPGs as something for everybody. Yeah. And writing this book, I think the thing that is becoming clearer and clearer is that D&D started it all. It was like a spark in a dry, grassy field. And that fire just went crazy and burned so many people and got them making games. But after that point, and it's almost immediate that the inflection happens, everybody who's got burned and got set on fire by D&D initially is moving at a faster pace than them. And D&D becomes a reaction to everything else that's going on in the role-playing design community, where... You see things first elsewhere, and then D&D kind of refines it and makes it a little bit more generic and palatable for their system. Then it sort of becomes classic role-playing thing. <laughs> it's just interesting that that happens, and you see it over and over and over again. And it's cool, because you can't really copyright ideas. You can't own them, and it's nice to see how things permutate from game to game. Well, it's definitely a thing, I think, where as that fire spreads, you have D&D &D creating, and then you have all these individual creators creating. And now the thing that separates them, and I think the thing that has lent itself to the enduring legacy of Dungeons & Dragons is because they did have to homogenize it. Because while all these creators were making one thing, D&D &D was busy trying to make everything for everybody. Yeah. And I think that's where the kind of difference comes in that's where the rub is where like yeah you have all these great ideas that eventually get sucked up churned tossed around mixed mangled and manufactured into a very specific standard and that is dungeons and dragons so Stu, do you have any final thoughts on harn i think that you should check it out i think that if you ever see a harn book in, a, in your secondhand store or like that back shelf of your comic book shop because they're probably there on discount Pick them up. They're not expensive at all. You could probably put together like a whole collection of Harn stuff for not a whole lot of money. Just if you see a Harn book, pick it up because Harn is cool. And I think that you'll you'll just generally be impressed by the amount of ideas that are in it. You can even check out the D20 Harn stuff that came out in the 2000s. That stuff is just as good and interesting. Very cool. Well, folks, this was another awesome episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Stu, where can the people find you? They can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG, posting about role-playing games, sometimes board games, sometimes heavy metal, every day. You can find me on the Twitter at Handbreaker. I tweet about board games. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about Dungeons & Dragons. You could also follow my day-to-day -day adventures in podcasting and in life over on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe because your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. If you really like the podcast, think about joining our Patreon, patreon.com slash VintageRPG. We have early release episodes. We've got behind-the-scenes looks at Stu's book and my game that I'm in the process of writing. We also have a killer Discord community that we'd love for you to be a part of, patreon.com slash VintageRPG. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 